I'm Lynn Woolridge. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Bermuda Cancer and Health Center. So once again, welcome. Um, this evening, the talk is on uh, colorectal uh, disease and cancer. And we have two speakers, Dr. Paula Estrick and Dr. Sane Ong. <clears throat> Dr. Estrick is gonna present first. She has been practicing medicine for over eight years. Uh, she's been educated in uh, Barbados and Cuba. She's a, a current member of the Medical Association of Jamaica. She has a passion um, for the medical professional fields. She loves to talk and interact with patients and offer mentorship for both patients and other medical professionals. Um, she also has strong areas of interest in integrative medicine, functional medicine, and preventative medicine. So she's in the right place this evening. Our second speaker is Dr. Sain Ong. Um, he's with the Bermuda Hospitals Board as Director of Oncology. Uh, he joined the Bermuda Hospitals Board uh, in October of 2014. Prior to that, he was with the Weinberg Cancer Institute at the Franklin Square Hospital Center from 2000. He has served uh, eight years as Chief of Hematology. He's a Clinical Assistant Professor of Medicine in the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He's also board certified in internal medicine, medical oncology, and hematology by the American Board of Internal Medicine, and he's a fellow of the American College of Physicians. All that to say, he's well qualified as well. I'll now invite uh, Dr. Estrick to the podium as she will present first. Good evening. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to make it publicly known. I may like to talk to my patients one-on-one, -on -one, but I hate public speaking. <laughs> so this is a big deal for me right now to be standing in front of you guys right now. Okay, so basically I'm going to concentrate on <clears throat> colorectal cancer from a primary care approach because that's why I am a primary care physician. Dr. Ong will go more in depth into the nitty gritty. So, <clears throat> so basically, I'm going to start on what is colorectal cancer and, you know, what is the colon. So this is the colon. It's part of our gastrointestinal tract. And colorectal cancer starts in the colon and the rectum. Wait, the rectum is right over here. And the rest of all of this, this is the colon. So as you can see, it's a big area for cancer. So... Cancer is basically where normal cells grow out of control, and after a while, these cells can also go and spread to other organs in the body, and that's called metastasis. So a few factoids about colorectal cancer. It is, in the, U the United States, is a major source of cancer incidence and death. And <clears throat> in 2019, there will be new one. 145,600 new cases of the disease and 51,020 deaths across the United States, making it the fourth most diagnosed form of cancer and second leading ca cause of cancer mortality. So as you can see, it's a big deal. <clears throat> Even though overall the mortality for colorectal cancer has been on the decline since the 1980s, and this has um, a lot to do with more information in terms of the risk factors for colorectal cancers, better screening, and so forth. Even though that's been happening, there's been an interesting change that over the last couple of decades, we have been seeing that the incidence and death of colorectal cancer has begun increasing in people under the age of 50. And this is a big concern, obviously. A recent study last year has shown that obesity is associated with increased risk of early onset colorectal cancer in women. These are women below 50. So colorectal cancer is Previously, when I was in school, we most, thought, we most of the time thought of it as uh, something that's more associated with men, but it is in probably the top three cancers in women. I'm right, Dr. Ong? Yes. So it's on the rise in women as well, and especially under the age of 50 years old. So this is a big concern, obviously. Mm. 
So colorectal has signs and symptoms. These signs and symptoms are not very specific. So this is why as doctors, we have when patients come in, we always have to have our thinking caps on, right? So number one is people who exchange, who have a change in bowel habits. So if you're a regular and all of a sudden you're starting to get constipated, you know, it is a constipation is a common symptom. A lot of us has con um, constipation, but this is something that you should probably talk to your doctor about. Now, diarrhea, narrowing of stools, that's a big one. Like if all of a sudden you, your, your stools are normal and all of a sudden they're pencil thin, that is something that you really would want to talk to your doctor about, okay? And not feeling empty after if you have a bowel movement, the rectal bleeding, of course, very important. Any kind of bleeding in the stools, go to your doctor. Don't think, hey, it's just hemorrhoids. It could be hemorrhoids, but it could be hemorrhoids and something else because I've seen it like that. Blood in stools, which in other words, if you start to see your colors look a little black color, that's what we call in Madison Molina, and that's because the blood has gotten broken down and it's changed the, school, the stool color. So black tarry stools, you definitely want to go to your doctor about that as well. Then you have cramping and abdominal pain, weakness and fatigue, and unintended weight loss, which is a sign of lots of different cancers. So anybody who's weight, losing weight and they don't know why, go to your doctor and get and see what was going on. <clears throat> so, as in primary care, sometimes people ha get diagnosed with colon cancer and they, they're not having any symptoms. One of the big tests that we, we look at is your complete blood count. And sometimes the only sign that, there is, that something is wrong is that a person who has previously had a normal blood count, all of a sudden their blood count has dropped. And we're wondering why. We can't find any, they don't have any bleeding that we know of, but you know, that would be something that we would say, hmm, what's going on with this person? Let's dig a little deeper and see what's going on. So sometimes you might not have any symptoms at all. And just on your annual physical, and this is why it's so important to have your annual physical, regardless of your age, that is an early sign of, of colon cancer. That's because sometimes what happens is this cancer might be just dripping blood drop by drop. You're not seeing any signs. You're not seeing any bleeding. You're not seeing any different colors in your stool, but you're losing this blood over time, and then your blood count drops. <clears throat> so as you, can, as you can see from before, most of the symptoms are nonspecific. Okay, these symptoms, who hasn't had a belly pain, who hasn't had diarrhea, constipation, all of those symptoms, are symptoms of many other conditions. So this is important. If, it, if something is lasting, I would say, you know, a couple of weeks, you definitely would want to have a conversation with your primary care physician, okay? Because lots of things like infection, hemorrhoids, irritable bowel syndrome, these can present in, with those symptoms, and you don't know what's, in, in, what's the difference. So that's for your doctor to kind of dig in a little deeply and make sure, you know, there's no cancer there, you know? So in terms of screening, now this is a big deal because recently, last year, the American College, no, sorry, American Cancer Society changed their guidelines. And these are the guidelines which I operate under, which is the guidelines changed from 50 years from screening for the normal population to 45 years. So basically what is screening? Screening is the process of looking for cancer in people who have no symptoms. Several tests can be used for colorectal screening. An example of a screening test is a pap smear in a female. That's an example of a screening test. So <clears throat> the most common screening tests are these stool-based tests, which we do. I don't know, many of you might have gone to your GP and during your annual physical, they give you a, <clears throat> a kit to check your stools and bring it back. And that will be looking for, that is what we call, uh, that's one of the screening tests that we do, fecal occult blood. That's what it is. And then there are the visual exams that basically you physically are looking at the structure of the colon itself and looking for any abnormalities. So the fecal occult test, this is which one? The fecal immunochemical test. This is the one that we do most of the time. In, well, this is the one that we ourselves do in primary care, which is send you for the stool test looking for blood. Because, and why? Because... This, the, hype, the idea is that a cancer or a polyp, their blood vessels tend to be a little more fragile and it's 
and they would and is easily damaged by the passage of stool so you will have if, even if you don't see blood blood might turn up in the stools and this is how we detect it right <clears throat> so the other kind of there are other types of um, stool tests but most of the time in our setting we just use the fecal occult blood it doesn't have any it's easy to do and there's no pre preparation for this test so it's pretty easy everybody can do it and there's the visual structural exams which the most common one is the um the colonoscopy now the colonoscopy now this is the one that people don't like so much because you have to have a little bit of prep before you do the colonoscopy so I stole this from you guys. <laughs> but yes, basically get your colonoscopies done. So for colonoscopy, basically the, your doctor, they use this thing called a colonoscope, which is a flexible, narrow tube with a camera. And they basically go all the way in the rectum and look through the colon, looking for anything looking suspicious. And this test is good because if they see anything suspicious, they can do a biopsy or they can remove things that, um, lesions. So this is, is also, is diagnostic as well as curative, you know? So it's a very, it, it is probably, for me, I like this test more than any of the others because basically you can have a little bit of therapeutics as well as diagnostics with it. Then there's the virtual colonoscopy, which is a special type of CT scan. It's not as invasive as a colonoscopy, but you still need some bowel prep. And then if they find something abnormal, you still have to get a colonoscopy anyway. So might as well just go and do the colonoscopy first off. <coughs> then there's this flexible sigmoidoscopy, which we're not really using anymore because half of the colon you can't see when you do, when you do it. So might as well just do the colonoscopy. If you're going to get something invasive done, you might as well just get this, the, the one that gives you the best results. So now these are the guidelines, the American Cancer Society guidelines for colorectal screening. So for people at average risk, average risk people would be basically people who have never had colon cancer, people who don't have a strong family history and don't have any other, any other things like inflammatory bowel disease and so forth, these people now start screening at the age of 45. And <clears throat> the idea behind this is because remember why I said previously that colon cancer has been on in the, um, in increased in people below the age of 50. So this is why they're kind of lowering the screening age now. So basically you start at age 45 and then you continue to the age of 75 every 10 years. If, if you do the colonoscopy, you can basically do it every 10 years once you don't, once your exam is normal and finish at age 75 and then through 76 and 85, depending on what previous colon, um, scan, previous results said and, you know, a conversation with your doctor, then you would decide if you still need to go forth. And then after the age of 85, there's no longer any, um, it doesn't really make sense doing it after the age of 85. So these are people who are not average risk. People who have a personal history of colorectal cancer or certain types of polyps, a family history of colorectal cancer. And that's first line relatives. That is your parents, a child, a sibling. If you have any of those people who have had colorectal cancer, especially if they have got diagnosed before the age of 45, that is a high, a high, you are at a higher risk and you should definitely have a conversation with your doctor from early. Uh, people who have a, a, um, a personal history of inflammatory bowel disease, that's ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Or if you have any of these hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes, which Dr. Ong will talk a little more about. And people who have other cancers, so people who have had like ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, or any kind of cancer who had radiation in the pelvic area, that normal screening age doesn't apply to you. This is something that you probably discuss with your doctor about how often you'll do screening. Um, so basically, this is basically why I had said before about the people who are increased, increased risk. So now let's go into the risk factors. So the risk for colorectal cancer is probably the most 
correlated with lifestyle as, as it pertains to most of the cancers, that and probably cervical cancer. But lifestyle is a very strongly linked lifestyle-related cancer. So things like diet, weight, exercise, have increase your, can increase your colorectal cancer risk. So number one, being overweight or obese. So that is a big set of us, myself included. So if you're overweight or obese, you want to be trying to do something about that, okay? Um, <clears throat> especially when you have a lot of fat around that waistline. So sometimes people might be not have fat in the other areas, but they have a lot of that fat around the waistline. I always tell my patient, fat doesn't just stay in your body and do nothing. It is a biologically active tissue. And when you have a lot of that, especially that abdominal fat, it participates in different reactions in your body. So it's not a good thing to have. So now we have physical inactivity, certain types of diet and diets. So Western diet that's high in red meats and processed meats, that is linked, very strongly linked to colorex or cancer. So probably the best diet would be the plant-based diet. Cooking meats at very high temperatures, they create like barbecuing and all that stuff. You probably want to want to limit that in your diet because they produce some chemicals which can increase your cancer risk. So other risk factors, smoking. Smoking is a risk factor for several cancers. Heavy alcohol use as well. So basically you want to, you know, reduce that alcohol consumption and keep it to two drinks for men and one drink for, for women daily. So colon cancer risk increase as you get older. If you have a personal history of colorectal cancer or polyps and a personal history of inflammatory disease, as I said before. So, okay, that's right. So this is another one. Racial and ethnic back backgrounds. African Americans have the highest colorectal cancer incidence and mortality rates of any racial group in the U.S. We are not quite sure, but a lot, it might have to do with lifestyle. It also might have to do with socioeconomic factors as well, because Af African Americans are notorious for not having the same access to health care in the United States as other racial groups. So it is a 20 increase higher incidence if you're of African <laughs> descent. So you definitely want to watch out for that. People with type 2 diabetes, well, <clears throat> Apart from having an increased risk of heart disease and, and, and whatever, people with type 2 diabetes also have an increase of colorectal cancer. It might have to do with other, the other things like being overweight or physical inactive, which are also linked to type 2 diabetes. But even after we take into account these factors, <coughs> people with type 2 diabetes still have an increased risk of colorectal cancer and a less favorable outlook. Probably have something to do with the immune system as diabetes is notorious for compromising that. So prevention, basically this is what we try to do in primary care. You know, it's best to, pre you know, prevention is better than cure, right? So number one, plant-based anti-inflammatory diets such as the Mediterranean Asian diets have been shown to reduce your, the risk of heart disease, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and certain can cancers, especially colon, which is their breast and other prostate cancer. Micronutrients, and this is why it's very important to have all your, oh, your, not only, I don't want to say vitamins, but it's important to have a wide variety of food in your diet as it pertains to, you know, your fruits and vegetables, because micronutrients can be very protective against colon um, colorectal cancer, including calcium, folate, and vitamin D. Well, vitamin D is, low vitamin D levels are linked to several types of cancer, including colon cancer. So most of us spend a lot of time indoors. We don't get enough sun. So probably most of us should be taking some vitamin D supplements because I test, I can't remember the last time I tested someone for vitamin D and their no levels were normal. We spend way too much time inside, covered up, especially after winter and so forth. Um... Other supplements like curcumin. Curcumin is basically the act, the um, the thing that makes turmeric as good as it in, as good as it is. So curcumin, which is a potent anti-inflammatory, mushrooms preparations have also been linked to lowering your 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 cancer risk. 
as well as because it supports your immune system and a healthy immune system, you know, that's what your one of the things that your immune system does. It doesn't only fight off infection, it's kind of surveying there and trying to protect you against cancer as well. And of course, being active. Now, being active, apart from decreasing, being an uh, active person is less likely to suffer from obesity or being overweight. Being active also changes your gut microbiome. And in the last five years, we in medicine are learning so much about the gut mi microbiome. And when I mean gut microbiome, I'm talking about the bacteria that live in your gut, which... <clears throat> which are not causing disease. These bacteria are very important in terms of our health. So you are only as healthy as your gut microbiome. So being active actually encourages a better variety of, gut, um, of good gut bacteria. So that's very important. So yeah, I'm at the end. So yeah, that's it. Okay. Good evening. Uh, I'm glad uh, to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, which month is colorectal cancer awareness month? March. March. Okay, <laughs> so, so I'm glad, you know, this is the month, so colorectal cancer. Um, so I'm glad to talk about this. So uh, I have nothing to disclose uh, regarding to this uh, talk. And, and the doctor is with already mentioned the statistics, so you know it's the third common cause in the United States, both in both men and women, and the second leading cause of cancer death and in both in the United States, both men and women. And the lung cancer is the, the, the first one. And as she already mentioned, uh, nowadays we are seeing the more and more young generation, young, young, young age to diagnose. Uh, colorectal cancer, that's very alarming. And we, did, we still don't know whether it is the same uh, biology or it's a different biology. We still don't know yet, but we definitely are paying attention to that. Uh, for the future, we may need to find the strategy how to manage for this problem. The globally, uh, the colorectal cancer is the third commonness in the men and the second commonness in the, wom in the women. And that uh, go along with Bermuda. Bermuda also, the man is the DHS, the colorectal is the third, and the uh, woman, the colorectal is the second commonness in Bermuda. What's the colon cancer? Dr. Swiss already mentioned. The colon cancer is the uh, cancer of the large intestine. So if you look at uh, from the uh, mouth to here's the esophagus and the stomach and then small intestine and then large intestine. So colorectal cancer is the cancer of the large intestine. The colon has not much function. Uh, the main function is absorb water. So that's the main function. So that's important. So the most of our nutrition is absorbed in the small intestine. So digestion done and the, as the absorption is done in the small intestine. So colon is more uh, absorption of the water. So to make the stool from very soft liquid to solidify. That's the main uh, function of the colon. It can happen anywhere. So it started with the cecum. And then ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and the last portion is rectum, and then anus. So that's why when the doctor does colonoscopy, 
they always make sure that they reach to the cecum. So you, you might see whenever you see the report or the, the, the scope reach the cecum, so they confirm that they look at the whole entire colon. Okay. Already risk factor has been explained, so I don't want to go detail, but the age, when you are getting older, or age itself is the risk factor. And now diet is very important. So high fat, low fiber. So high fat, low fiber. That is the definitely high risk. So in other words, this is a typical for our Western, we call Western diet, okay? So Western diet, and, and also not only that, you know, Western, here's the obesity, and the physical activity, and smoking, I think you already mentioned, alcohol and diabetes. So because of the, uh, the, these, the diet and obesity, these are important. If you look at the wall map, okay, uh, the highest, look at the highest incidence. I mean, look at all these, okay? Look at these, look at the euro, okay? These are where, well, these are where the highest number of the uh, colorectal cancer, there's a Western, Look at India, okay, here's India, but they are most are vegetarian, okay, so look at that, you know, like this, the, the, the risk is much lower. So Again, this is for women, the other one is for the men. Look at the same, you know, the, the highest number, mm, look at the Europe and America, and, and look at the India, you see, <laughs> so then you can see the, it's definitely telling us that what we eat, or how we do, is very important. And then she already mentioned the prior history of cancer is the most important cancer. So the mo the, it's the very important risk factor. And the prior radiation, and also having the prior polyps itself is a risk factor. And the family history and inflammatory moral disease, this has been all discussed. Now the most important, the, these are, we call like a, intermediate risk. So the other risk is the standard risk. Everybody, when you get old, when you have hypertension, when you get the diabetes, if you smoke, these are the standard risks. Now this is more than standard risk. This is like intermediate risk. And the other one is, this is the real high risk. This is super high risk. So familiar adenomatous polyposis syndrome. And that's the condition, it's called autosomal dominant. So it, it runs in family, it transmits from gene uh, by the gene from parents to the, the next generation, their uh, children. So that uh, is autosomal dominant. And the, another condition is called uh, Lynch syndrome or hereditary non polyposic colon cancer, HNPCC. They both are autosomal dominant. So the first one, uh, fam familiar adenomatous polyposis syndrome. Uh, in patients, there are so many polyps in the entire colon, and sometimes, you know, maybe hundred to thousands. And that can start very early stage. They started, they started as a polyps, and later they developed the colon cancer. And the risk of colon cancer is extremely, extremely high, about 90%, just if the patient has full of familiar, uh, you know, the FAP. So the screening, that's what, you know, the, uh, we're talking about the screening, is not the same for every patient. Not, one shoe fit for everybody. So it's standard risk, already discussed, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, intermediate risk and also for the very high risk. So in high risk, the, in FAP, then even we can start uh, screening at age of 12, and then we have to be very careful. And we, the, 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 the reason is we want to take action before it develops the cancer. So we may need to take uh, surgery early. And hereditary familial, hereditary non polyposic colorectal cancer, it is the, the common, very common, is the, the commonest, uh, the familial after the FAB. But having said that, these two combined are only accounting for five, around about four, five percent of all colon cancer. So, majority, in, they don't have this one. So, yes, it is very important high risk factor, but it's only four to five percent of all colon cancer. And the hereditary uh, HN, the non-polyposic colorectal cancer, so it runs in family, so we pay attention to if the patient has uh, just, instead of just one family member with colorectal cancer, another one, 
and also not only in the same family, oh, my aunt, my cousin, so if he has two generations, and sometimes, oh, my mom, my aunt, or also my generation, and also children, so we look at for three generations. If there's the three generations, and also there's more than one person, and one person has colon cancer at the age of less than 50, then they, we start looking for the uh, HMPCC. So you can see this is a general risk, and the general population is about 5%, but if they have the personal history, these are like intermediate risk. And these are the intermediate risk from the um, inflammatory bowel disease, but once you have these two conditions, I told you that's very high risk, and they, then their lifetime, their lifetime risk is extremely high. So we, that's why we pay attention to this. How do they present what well, the uh, already discussed? So the most important is symptomatic. Many patients have no symptom whatsoever. That's why you know people may not be diagnosed until it is too late. So what is the screening? Screening means no symptom at all. Patient is absolutely normal, no symptom whatsoever, and we're still looking for is there any evidence of early stage cancer, that's the screening. Why do we do screening? It's very clear, we want to detect very early stage. So there are the proven uh, screening, which a benefit, uh, you know, you all know, memory, uh, the uh, mammogram screening, and the cervical uh, smear, pep smear screening, and the colorectal cancer screening. So to detect the asymptomatic stage, that's the most important. So based on the, uh, as, you know, the, the risk factor, even asymptomatic, the, we used to screen at the age of 50, but now, as we mentioned, it will start at the age of 45. Now the other is, depending on the uh, location, now if it's on the left side, it's more like uh, alternating constipation, diarrhea, and if it's in the uh, rectum, then more rectal bleeding and all the anemia, iron deficiency anemia, when they lose blood, they feed fire, uh, fatigue, tiredness, weight loss, all these have been mentioned, and sometimes patients may feed the lung, especially if the right-sided colon is the colon in different area, the right-sided right -side one may present with more anemia, and they may have fatigue, and the left-sided one can have some blockage. Now, sometimes uh, the abdominal pain is not very common. You know, it can cause it, but it is the, the down, the list is at the bottom. So the most important is asymptomatic. So it is very important. Sometimes they never have the screening. They never see the doctor. So by the time when they have the real problem, they came to the emergency. And by the time when they come, we found, oh my God, there's a severe abdominal pain. The ER doctor did an x-ray, found, there's intestinal obstruction. It's already blocked. The tumor is getting bigger. So, you know, the lumen was gradually blocked, 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 blocked. And later, they cannot pass uh, stool. They cannot uh, move forward. The, the, the food cannot move forward. And then patients start having intestinal obstruction, vomiting, so pain, vomiting, constipation. And sometimes worse than that, and it's perforate. It, when it perforate, and then it can cause the peritonitis. So these are all, you know, the uh, possible presentations. Sometimes uh, they don't have the major problem from the local uh, tumor itself, but the tumor cancer has already spread and have metastatic disease. So they can present with the metastatic disease symptoms like vision orange jaundice or a yellow jaundice. And then we found that, oh, the patient has cancer already spread to the liver. And sometimes they have the very shortness of breath and cough. And then we found that, oh, there are multiple metastatic disease in the lung, or they have fluid, you know, in the building up in the lung, so they cannot breathe, and what do you do? Oh, they have fluid, primarily uh, the, the pleural effusion. So these all can present in the, when they are at the late stage. And if it's going to the bone, and they might have severe bone pain, and that might be the first presentation. Okay. Diagnosis. We can have the screening for many tests, as you know, Dr. S. We, uh, already mentioned. However, the diagnosis, to make the diagnosis, we need the actual tissue 
to look at under the microscope. So we need the colonoscopy, and from the colonoscopy, and we can get the biopsy, and then we diagnose. Now, sometimes patients already metastatic disease and already multiple lesions in the liver. Now, in that kind of setting, we may just, okay, just do the biopsy of the liver lesion, and then if liver lesion shows uh, metastatic cancer and it is consistent with uh, colon, then we already get the diagnosis and we may not need to do the, another colonoscopy. So that is the, in some circumstance when late presentation, we might do that. So how, after the diagnosis, how do we stage? What are the stage of colon cancer? It might be from stage zero, one, two, three, and four. Zero means the cancer does not spread yet. It is only in the lining of the colon. Uh, the, the colon. So that's called in situ or stage zero. So to know that uh, you need the anatomy of, a little bit anatomy of the colon wall. And if you look at the colon, colon is a tube. I, I, as I mentioned, and the, in the tube, there's the, in the wall, there are the different layers. The innermost layer is called mucosa, and after that submucosa, then muscle, the, which contract the, and the food to move forward. And then outside is the coating, called the serosa, like we wear the clothes. So if you look at the here, so let me show you. So the innermost is, this is the, the mucosa, is the innermost layer, mucosa and then submucosa. So between mucosa and submucosa, there's a thin layer, it's called muscular mucosae, and after that, then muscle. These are the muscle, and then, sorry, the, the, this is the um, uh, mucosa, and this is the muscular mucosae, so this is the submucosa, and then this is the muscle, and the outside is called the serosa, okay? So the cancer always starts in the lining here, the mucosa. So when it starts, it started here, and then gradually it invades into the submucosa. Once it's passed through here, and then later it moves on. So if the cancer is only in this area without going into the submucosa, that's what we call in situ or stage zero. Once it's passed through this muscular mucosa into the submucosa, that's what we call stage one. And one is passed beyond this and into the muscle, that's called stage two. And after that, it can go outside. So in another, uh, here, another, the cartoons, so you can see innermost layer is the mucosa, and then submucosa, and then muscle, and then outside is the coating. So the staging, again, the only in the lining is stage zero, and the, this is only mucosa only. It doesn't go into the submucosa. Once it's passed into the submucosa, that's stage one. And it go into the muscle itself is stage two. And then when it spreads outside the colon and to the nearest limb nodes, that's what we call stage three. And then beyond that and go into the other organs like the liver, lung, bone, brain, these become stage four, okay? Now, we are, this is the stage we want to pick up all, oh, okay, <laughs> if possible. Unfortunately, look at that. We could pick up only 15%. You know, the majority, even some people, by the time when we know it's already quite all, the patient is already stage four, metastatic disease. Now, stage two and three, so both stage one, two, and three are stay curable. In other words, stay, we can aim for the cure. Stage four is not curable. Uh, only very subset, very, very subset can be cured. I'll, I'll talk about later. So at least, at least, if possible, I, we want to pick up during stage one, two, or three. No, 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 be, before this stage. I want, we want to pick up at least these. And this is the best. We want, to, we want this all, but look at, you know, like, so we are not doing the good job because maybe the patient, maybe the physician, so that's, uh, that's very frustrating. So how do we evaluate once we diagnose that patient had the uh, cancer? So that to know these staging, so we have to do the uh, CAT scan. So that's why you might see after the patient diagnosed with the colonoscopy diagnosis, so we do the CAT scan. And also we draw the blood test for tumor marker 
They also will look at for the hemoglobin level, how about the patient anemic level, and we all look at the liver function, kidney function. So we draw the blood. And so CEA, what is CEA? CEA is the carcinoid embryonic antigen. It is the, like a chemical structure made by the cancer cell, and we can measure the actual level. So it reflects the volume of the tumor. So the higher the volume, then the higher the level of the CEA. So the lower CEA, the better. But there's no direct correlation. Sometimes volume may be high and CEA may be not that high. That's also, so it's not direct uh, correlation. However, in general, if CEA is low, then we are happy. If CEA is high, that's more uh, reflecting the high volume. CEA is not for the diagnosis. That's very common. Sometimes patient, you know, like it's very common question, even with maybe primary care, can I get my CEA? Um, because I want to know whether I have cancer. There's no such a thing that the blood test can tell definitely you have the cancer. Only the histology, we, we can diagnose the cancer. However, CEA is helpful after the diagnosis. Once the patient is diagnosed with the colon cancer, and when we measure the level, if the level is high, that is very good for the, long, for the further follow-up. So when we, somebody with a very high CEA, so we treat it, and then we recheck the CEA, CEA level is down, and then we monitor serially, and when CEA starts going up, that is very helpful and useful. Wow. Now patient C is down and now up again. So whether is there any recurrence of the cancer. So that's useful, but not for the diagnosis. Nowadays, now we do the molecular testing as well because the cancer, the, there are only two medicines available. There was two medicine, only two medicine, you know, when I was in medical school. And even when I started my uh, oncology training uh, about 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, we have only two medicines. That's all we have. Colon cancer, well, that's it. That's all we have. But now, it's gradually the name of the, med the, the, the medicine. Every year, every, you know, uh, we have so many medicine uh, developed and many patients benefit. And the, now we know that colon cancer is not just one cancer. They are different cancer. They behave differently. They react differently. They treatment uh, differently based on the... DNA of the cancer. So now we are looking the actual molecular testing, uh, and then the treatment is now moving towards the uh, these mutation. So what's the goal of the therapy? As I mentioned to you, if it's stage zero, one, two, or three, yeah, we can stay cure. So we treat as a curative intent. And if was over, we want to pick up everything here, <laughs> okay? So, but what's the stage four that we know is not curable? And then the treatment is palliative. Now, as I told you, only some set of the patient, even stage four colon cancer, stay be curative. So for example, patient with the colon cancer with only one lesion in the liver, one metastasis in the liver. So if we, if we can remove the primary tumor as well as the metastatic one lesion, if we remove, then with the treatment chemotherapy, then they can still be cured. And depending on the series, and sometimes somewhere 20 to 40% can be cured, even though stage four with the isolated liver. But in general, unresectable cancer the, is not curable. So if it is stage zero, so how do we do? that we do the surgery, and surgery means, stage zero means, is a, as I told you, it is only in the mucosa, in the lining, only in the lining. So if it is polyp, and polyp, so five, about 5% five of the polyp can be cancerous. If it's for polyp, we can just snap it during endoscopy, not only endoscopy uh, diagnostic, and the, the endoscopy can just cut the, uh, polyp, this we call polypectomy, and that might be the end of the story. Or sometimes there are two types of polyp, so I'll show you later. And if it is the, with the, not the stock, with the cell side polyp, which is stuck to the mucosa, then the uh, endoscopy has to remove the whole cell side polyp. 
Now, if it cannot be done, or if the polyp is moved move towards the uh, deeper layer, and sometimes uh, just endoscopic research is not available, and then the surgeon has to go in and cut that piece, the real resection of the uh, colon may be done. Now that's, so stage one, the same stage one is the tumor is from the mucosa, go into the submucosa, but not to the mast cells yet, and, but once it passes into the submucosa, then patient needs surgery. Not just endoscopy is not enough. So stage zero is perfect, but stage one, the patient will start need, uh, they will need the surgery. So this is the cartoon. You can see if the polyps, you can see the, when you do the polyps, one is the polyp with the stock, the other one is a, side, is a flat polyp. So if it is the, this is easy, the junior endoscope, then you can cut it. And this one, you have to take with big forceps to take all these. But as long as it is just uh, lining, mucosa, then we can still do that endoscopic resection. So this is the picture where the endoscopic board and cut it off. So the, the colonoscopy is not only diagnostic, it can be therapeutic. Now stage two, I do, stage two means the cancer is already spread beyond the submucosa. It's now into the muscle. Once it is in the muscle, then definitely we cannot just do from the endoscope. And then we have to refer to the surgeon. The surgeon has to open. The surgeon has to cut that piece and then read anastomose. But stay okay, stay maybe curative. So stage two, after surgery, majority are cured, just surgery alone, if it's low risk. So again, stage two are not the same. Even though stage two, there are different uh, patient, different risk. So if stage two, low risk, they are very good with 80% survival, so we don't need to give chemotherapy. Now, even though stage two, if there's high risk, surgery alone, you drop the survival significantly. So we need to consider adjuvant chemotherapy to improve the survival. So what are the high risks? So during surgery, they feel if it's perforated, so you wait, the patient waited too long, if it's perforated, it's already blocking, obstruction, there's already high risk. And when we, the surgeon cut it, and the pathologist look at under the microscope, see how aggressive looking. If it's poorly differentiated, mean, the, it is nasty looking tumor under the microscope. Now that's by the pathologist. Sometimes, well, this is cancer, but this cancer look very nice. It's not, you know, it's very uh, well organized. It's not really bad. So that's called, we call the uh, fully uh, differentiated and it's, it's a low grade. But if it is high grade and they're poorly differentiated, then we need, um, uh, this, this, this will be in the high risk group. And also, uh, this is for the oncologist, you know, because you know the when the surgeon cut, surgeon not only cut the colon. So whenever they do the uh, operation, they cut the colon, and they also take the mesentery and the nearby lymph nodes uh, are taken out. So the lymph nodes normally they took about twelve minimum. We want to see twelve lymph nodes because if the lymph nodes are involved with the cancer, that's stage three. So if no lymph nodes involvement, that's stage two. So how we can be sure stage two if the surgeon take only two limb nodes. And there may be you know, cancer in other limb nodes. So we want to see at least 12 limb nodes evaluated. And if, they, if, they, if we don't see any report, only five limb nodes, six limb nodes, eight limb nodes, then we know it is not adequately sampled and we stay regarded that's a higher risk. So if higher risk and this just leaving a patient after surgery without chemo is not uh, it is it, definitely reduced the survival, so we try to then at that kind of mission, we add the uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. Okay, now if it is stage three, definitely we, as I mentioned, you stage three, once the limb nodes are involved, we always consider this chemotherapy. Why we are aggressive? Sometimes patients say, Well, you know, stage two, stage three, uh, why are you aggressive? Now, these, as I mentioned, you stage one, two, three, stage curable. So in oncology, there are two basic principles. So many people sometimes don't understand that we have the same chemotherapy. However, approach is different. If the patient has stage which is still curable, then we want to be more aggressive. We know if we give the aggressive chemo, 
patient can be sick, patient can have the nausea, vomiting, and the most important for women, hair loss. So we know that nobody like it, I don't like it, patient don't like it, but knowing that there is still chance for cure, uh, sometimes we have to take the risk. So we are more aggressive and we get more aggressive chemotherapy when there is curable. Now when stage four is not curable disease, and we know we cannot cure. So the goal is more towards the palliation to improve the survival. Even though I cannot cure, at least patient dying within six months versus dying two years, then at least we can improve the survival. So the goal of the treatment in stage four or incurable disease is to improve patient survival. And the most important is to improve patient quality of life. So patient having pain, blockage, if we give chemo, if we shrink down, if the symptoms are better, that's very important. So the goal is to improve the symptom, to improve the quality of life, and any possible means to improve survival with a meaningful uh, improved survival. So to do that, we are not as aggressive as in the uh, adjuvant treatment setting. In intuitive setting, aggressive treatment, but in palliative setting, we try to use less chemotherapy, less aggressive chemotherapy, and less uh, medication. Why do we give the adjuvant chemo? As we mentioned, if the, if there, there's so many uh, studies have been done, and it's clearly doing the adjuvant chemo improve about 20, 10 to 20% absolute benefit in colorectal cancer. So that's why it's very important to receive the chemotherapy. The chance of survival after chemotherapy is much higher. So stage two and three, these are all chemotherapy available. Now again, if it's low risk, we may not need to give chemo. Even the, uh, in, uh, some, uh, the, the uh, high risk, within the high risk, the, again, is individualized. Nowadays, no, we have to, not all patients can get the same chemo. Uh, some people, sometimes I have to, you know, the patient questioning, you know, my friend, he doesn't get this chemo, why I got this chemo? And, you know, I, I'm more aggressive, you know, my friend is not. Why he's a pill, why I'm in uh, IV chemo? Well, it depends on individual, so we always have to think about the patient characteristic, patient age. Age is not very important, it's more important is the patient uh, functional capacity, we call performance status, how good the patient are. And patient may be 85, but might be very good. And that another patient may be only 70, but patient has already has a stroke, and patient has severe COPD, has CHF, heart failure on oxygen. That kind of patient may not do very well, even the patient may be 80 years with a very good performance status. So we look at, we call, we don't look at the chronological age, we look at the uh, biological age so for in making decision. So there are different uh, chemotherapy, the capecitabine is the pill. Um, the in 5-FU is the intravenous uh, chemotherapy. These two are the same. The capecitabine is a pro-drug. So when you give the capecitabine, it is absorbed, and then later it is uh, going into the tumor cell, and then it finally it changed into the 5-FU. So basically, this one is the pro-drug, and we can give as an oral. So some patients fit with the oral, some patients fit with the IV. Also, the side effects are different. So in short, the Cape Cytovine, it can cause more, we call handful syndrome, the very peeling of the skin and pain, and all that's the more uh, problem with the Cape Cytovine. And infusion of 5 shoe, it can cause more diarrhea and it can have the low uh, blood count. So depending on patient, and somebody with a very uh, severe neuropathy, then, and, and somebody who use hand a lot, and that might not be the first choice, and then that might be a better choice. So we, we customize and, uh, depending on the individual uh, need and uh, underlying condition. Now these two are the regarded, the, so full fox is the standard, uh, regarded as a standard treatment for the stage two and three in the, basically all over the world, the United States and also in Europe. And it includes the oxaloplatin, 5U and the So oxaloplatin, oxaloplatin, the main side effect is it can cause neuropathy, very bad neuropathy. And again, the degree of neuropathy also different, is, is not the same, it's different from one person to another. Now the, the other one is called K-Pox, and we also call the Z-Lox, anyhow. And it's a combination of the oxaloplatin, but not with the uh, IV, with the pill. So, 
Uh, it depends on individual. The pill, the good thing with the pill is the patient doesn't need the IV line uh, for the continuous infusion. If the patient, the like full fog is the IV, uh, so the patient need the IV, but the patient doesn't need to take the pill, and they finish in two, three days, they're done. So some people prefer, yeah, I'd rather get the IV. I, in three days, I'm done. And some people say, no, I don't like the line. I, let me get the pill. So it, it's a patient preference, uh, underlying condition, and then that's how we we share, we make the decision with the patient. We always share decision and we, we always, uh, uh, you know, give information and the patient, of course, is uh, involved in the making decision of which type of treatment. But generally, all these are equivalent. So this is mainly for the adjuvant. Adjuvant means adjunct treatment in addition to surgery. That's what we call the adjuvant. If it's stage four, again, I told you, majority are not the candidate for surgery because they are not curable. So some people say, I have the surgery, but why when the other people have no surgery? Uh, having said that, because in stage four disease, you know, even if you go and remove the primary tumor in the colon, the organ will not be, the, will not be different. Whether somebody has the removal of primary colon versus no removal, if they already have the metastatic disease everywhere in the liver and lungs, the outcome will be the same. However, we still, remove, we still do the surgery if the patient is bleeding, if the patient is having vomiting. And so sometimes we decide not to, do the, not to remove the primary tumor, but at least we got diversion. So just to uh, create a, what we call the colostomy is the back, you know, the, the, before the obstruction, the surgeon make a hole, take the uh, loop of the colon and they make the hole and they create a diversion area. So the patient has to wear the bag and then stool you know, can be collected there and doesn't go to the obstruction area. So it is very important for the, somebody with the obstruction. Why do we treat stage four disease? Is it incurable? You say it's incurable and the patient's dying. So why are you doing this? So we have this very common question. Why are you giving this poison? Okay. Yes, this is poison, <laughs> but this poison helps. Because without treatment, without the, before we have any chemotherapy, the stage four colon cancer is six months. So that's the median survival, six months. With new therapy, the first one uh, was the, we call the liver mysore, five year liver mysore, then five year leucoborin, and all these, the other medicine I mentioned. So with all new medicine in stage four, it prolonged the life for nowadays we are seeing Two, more than two years plus median survival. So it's improved from six months all the way to one year, one and a half, two years, and now over two years. And some patients are even living five years. So that's why the, even though stage four disease, we still recommend chemotherapy. What are the chemotherapy? Now, there's additional medicine called erinotecan, uh, which was not good for the adjuvant therapy, but it's good for the metastatic setting. So either... One, so some people are just one agent, capsaicin. some are just five FU, some are combined, and some are either oxaloplatin and five FU, some are a new patient medicine I call, uh, as I mentioned, the erinotecan and five FU. So you can combine, and in younger patients, with really good, which we, if, when we need to control the disease really bad, sometimes even we combine both oxaloplatin, erinotecan, and five FU. All three combined is called for ferrin. So for FOX3, and, but not for every patient, of course. So this, these are available treatment, but based on the individual needs then we customize. In addition to that, nowadays, now we have more agents available, which is good news. And this one agent, one, the class is called anti-vascular endothelial growth factor receptor blocking agent. So there are, Bepicizumab is the first one, and then later there's another two agents coming. And also there's anti, we call EGFR agent, endothelial <coughs> growth factor receptor agent, it's called cetuximab, pentatumimab. Now, but these, is, these agents particularly are uh, not affected if the patient has KRS or NS mutation. So that's why we need to check it out, the, the molecular testing. Only if the patient has negative or no mutation, then these agents are affected. So if they are negative, that's very effective. So that's one of the uh, agent we can, and this agent can be combined with the chemotherapy. So the previous, you know, chemotherapy, which one is the best, which one is for the patient, and we can combine that 
a chemotherapy to these agents. Now, some set, subset of the patient is not very common. Is another mutation called BRAF mutation. So if BRAF mutation is positive, then there's, now we have the available agent which block the BRAF mutation called BRAF inhibitor, and that's available. So we can combine this to the chemotherapy. So by doing that, that's how we improve the survival uh, you know, gradually to uh, two plus year nowadays. After they fill all these first line, second line, and so also if I go back, sometimes you know, like people say, oh, which one should I start? Well, we have so many studies done. If patients start with this, we know this is incurable disease. Patient will have the progression, patient will have the recurrence, or metastatic is getting worse at one point, we know that. So if we start with this, and when they progress, we can switch to this. If they, we start from here, when they progress, we can switch to this. Which one is better? So when we started, the study was done comparing this first, this first, first, and then crossover, and there's no difference. So that's why nowadays we have no preference. Now this aeronautican based can cause more diarrhea, and the oxaloplatin can cause more neuropathy. So if my patient has diabetes and with a neuropathy, this will be my first choice. If the patient is having severe diarrhea, IBS, then this will be my first choice, and then we can cross over. Okay. After we fill the first line, second line, and is there anything else? Now, during the last decades, uh, we, we are lucky we have some more medicine. However, it's not the home run. Uh, but at least we have some to provide after they fill the first and second line. So the regorofenib is the marikinase inhibitor, it's the pill, and it's also v, uh, VEGF blocking agent. Uh, but the problem is, you know, yes, it is effective, it's FDA approved, but it can improve only one and a half months, the survival, and, but it's very expensive. The next one, the DEX-102, is also effective, even a patient fail the other chemo, we can still consider to offer this also the pill. Again, the survival improvement is only a couple of months, so not like the others. So very expensive, but minimal benefit. So it's very difficult to uh, justify to treat, in, especially in Bermuda. In Bermuda, all the uh, oral medications, patient has to be 20% copay. So, so it's, it, it is, it's a challenge. Now the other set uh, is anti-PD-1 inhibitors. You might have seen on the television, you know, like the uh, nevolumab, and then you might see all the the, the uh, Ordevo, you know, all these uh, uh, advertisement for the lung cancer. So it was started for the lung cancer. This this immunotherapy, so anti-PD-1. So immunotherapy uh, is was initially approved for lung cancer, and now we are moving to almost every cancer. And what we found was in one particular set of the sub subset of the patient in uh, metastatic disease, if the patient, uh, again, there's a molecular testing, we have to do the molecular testing. If MSI is high, MSI stands for uh, the uh, microsatellite instability, if it is very high, that particular set of the patient, they do benefit from the anti-PD-1 inhibitor, and then the response rate is about 40%, 50%, which is pretty good. So uh, there are, you know, uh, new agents adding, adding, but we still have uh, a long way to go and there's lots of the room to improve. So I want to talk a little bit about the rectal cancer. So most are the, I told you, colon cancer is uh, starting from the cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon. So rectum is the last part of the, in the GI tract just before the anus. So that's about 30% of the colorectal, the, in the in large colon cancer, large uh, intestine cancer, the rectum is about, roughly about 30%. So the treatment is slightly different. The, the rectum is, under the, we call the serosa and peritoneum is behind the peritoneum. So it is not moving, not like the colon. Colon is with the mesentery, so with the uh, serosa colon move, you know, from one area to another. But the rectum is generally uh, behind the, these lining, so it is generally fixed. It doesn't move much. So, and the, when we 
follow up the rectal cancer, it has more tendency to have local recurrence. So local recurrence is very high in rectal cancer. So in rectal cancer, the main treatment, tre the treatment is the, we always want to get the radiation to edit the chemo and radiation. So if it, even early stage, even after surgery, we always want to add the chemo. So here, we should add the radiation therapy as well. So chemotherapy and the radiation therapy, we, we, after surgery, we stay with it. Now, sometimes, the, because it is uh, not move and it is in tendency to move more uh, towards the nearby structure, so it's very difficult for a surgeon to operate when initial diagnosis was made. Now, in this setting, then we try to give before chemo, uh, the surgeries, we call the pre-operated, we give chemo and radiation first to shrink down the tumor so that it is, makes surgeon life easier so the surgeon can operate. And then after operation, then we still give the chemotherapy after the surgery. Stage four, rectal cancer is basically the same as the uh, colon cancer. There's no much difference. Now, some patients may have the emergency surgery, as I, as I mentioned you before. If they come in with the uh, obstruction, unfortunately, they need colostomy. So that's also a very common question. Some people say, why is that some patient has the back and why I need to have the back? Some patients, they don't need the back. Well, if there's no signs of obstruction, then surgeon can, if we stage one, stage two, stage three, I meant to you, I show you, surgeon can just go in, cut it, that piece, and reconnect the, the, the first end, and then the, you get the middle, here's the tumor, you cut it, and we reconnect these two. No, we don't need any back. But if it's already blocking, and we cannot just operate because it's not safe. There is the danger of the peritonitis infection. So we have to, even we cannot move it. We have to just make it, pull it uh, just before the tumor area and make the hole and you just create a small little uh, ostomy and that's called colostomy. So a patient may need that and some patient may need even permanent colostomy depending on the areas. Some people need the laparotomy and they have the perforation so we have to treat for that. So, what is important? The lifestyle in colorectal is a survivor. If you survive, if you have surgery, if you have the adjuvant chemotherapy, regular exercise, exercise, that's very important. So I already mentioned that the obesity, especially BMI more than 35, is the high risk for the recurrence of the cancer. So, if the patient has diagnosis of cancer, doing exercise, losing weight is absolutely, absolutely important. Smoking cessation, absolutely important and avoidance of the Western pattern diet. So eat more healthy, eat more green, and less uh, fat. That's very important, okay? So lifestyle uh, is very important. Aspirin and colon cancer. So that's very hot in topics because the, we know aspirin from the initial um, study was done for the uh, observational study and the later and the, face, and, uh, the prospect, retrospective study, meta-analysis, and, uh, and also prospective study. Clearly, at aspirin reduced the risk of the polyps. That's we do know. So we know most of the cancer also can develop from the polyps. So by reducing the incidence of the polyps, can we reduce the colon cancer risk? Well, that is not prospectively confirmed yet. We know it reduced the polyp, but we don't, we cannot say definitely it reduced the risk of the, so we cannot say level one uh, recommendation. However, there are observational studies showing that patients who take this um, aspirin regularly, they reduce the risk of the colon cancer incidence. So most of the oncologists, including myself, if the patient has no contraindication for the aspirin, no contraindication, no issue for the bleeding, no issue for the, we recommend to take the aspirin, low-dose aspirin daily, and I, I, and I also take it. Okay. Now, they are doing the phase three study. So three studies, now, now is there any definite reduction risk? So this is still, we don't have the mature data. If some studies are already completed, but we're still waiting for the final report. Until then, we cannot uh, recommend fully, but if there's no contraindication, I don't think there's any downside taking the aspirin because it's number one, it's cheap, 
and you know, it's not expensive. And, but it's not for patient with the GI you know, upset, who, who has GI upset, of course, and, and elderly who has, you know, who has risk for bleeding. Now that's, that's the difference. But this is, uh, so this will be coming along and then we need to fine tune, okay? Vitamin D and colorectal cancer, again, you already mentioned that. So we know the vitamin D level in metastatic colon cancer. This is already met patient, already had metastatic colon cancer and study look at how about the patient with the low vitamin D level versus the normal and the high level. What's the outcome? And the clearly low vitamin D increased risk for the death. So the survival is poor than the uh, uh, high level. So this is study, as you can see, and the hazard ratio means how many risks. So hazard, hazard ratio 0.83 means there's a more like 27, a 17% chance more risky to death, and 0.65 means 35% risk of dying more. So if you look at the level of the plasma vitamin D level, so the lower plasma vitamin D, the higher the risk of the death. And when the plasma level is, the vitamin D is up, 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 and the risk of dying from, this is metastatic, already metastatic colon cancer, definitely reduce. It's, this is the same treatment in addition to other systemic treatment. Somebody with a higher level of the vitamin D has less risk of dying from this metastatic colon cancer. So it's very big. And if you look at the across the board, which type of patient benefit and look at the age, race, sex, what type of chemo, which combination, doesn't matter. Across the board, the higher vitamin D improves the survival. That is only in metastatic disease. So we do know that's for sure. That's already, uh, now we don't know if they are low. If we give it, will it improve the outcome? We still don't know yet. We know if it's low, it's bad. But we don't know if we give it, if it's increased, will it improve? So the study is done now. So, stage three. so what we know from that prospective study is at least there's progression-free survival. That means the remission endeavor is better in uh, early stage uh, colorectal cancer, stage two, three. But we don't know the survival data. It's stage too early, so we were have to fine tune, and once it is confirmed, that will be really uh, important to, to supplement. Now, we say don't know, so the data is only for the metastatic disease. We still don't know early stage. That's why the study done for, for both metastatic and the early stage, and that's prospectively randomized, and then we're still waiting for the result. Now, the other question is, okay, we know if it's low, it's bad. Now, how about if it is normal? The vitamin D is already normal. If we give additional vitamin D, will it be better? See, we don't know. That part, we still don't know. So having said that, even though it's not quite clear, vitamin D is very cheap, okay? And also vitamin, low vitamin D can be associated with the osteoporosis type. We call the, we don't call osteoporosis, we call osteomalacia, you know, low vitamin D. In, in children, it can cause a ricket, a ricket, ricket. So the patient, if the low vitamin D, I think it's very appropriate to uh, give the supplement because it's cheap and we have data, the low is not good. Even though it may, how much it will improve, we don't know. But if it's low, then definitely. So I check all my patient colon retic cancer, check the vitamin D level. If it is normal, that's okay. If it is low, I suggest to take the vitamin D supplement. Then surveillance after treatment, then we have to follow up. So what do we do? So the standard is the physician regular follow-up and also surveillance colonoscopy. That means um, to have the regular follow-up colonoscopy, even though patient already completed this treatment. Now it depends on the risk and the I mean, you don't need to know detail, but the endoscopy will explain to you. And that generally, generally, if there's general risk, and after the patient uh, uh, had the surgery, chemotherapy, then we follow up repeat colonoscopy in one year. If one year is absolutely good, no polyps, everything good, and we repeat in three years. And if it's still good, and we continue with every five years. 
Some patients, when they repeat colonoscopy, if there's a polyps, depending on types of the polyps, a low-risk polyps, then we repeat in somewhere three to five years, high-risk polyps, then we repeat in one year. But no polyps at all, it might be good for another five years. And uh, surveillance CT scan. So we also follow with the annual CT scan. Now, depending on the, you know, look at the ASCO, is, we stand for American Society of Clinical Oncology, and ASMO is the European Society of uh, Medical Oncology, and the, and the other thing is called the NCCN, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. All, you know, the, depending on the society, they will be slight different, but in general, everybody agree, agree uh, and the up to five years, we knew the colonoscopy, uh, the CT scan, very high risk, maybe every six months for a couple of years, and then every year. If it's not very high risk, maybe just once a year, uh, for so, so up to five years, we follow with the CAT scan. And also, now here is the benefit of the serious CEA measurement. So we do follow the CEA. Once the patient is diagnosed with colon cancer, we already treat it, and then the CEA is helpful and useful in that setting. Okay, so here's the take-home message. So please, please, please do not put off the colonoscopy when you are due because we want to pick up stage zero if it's the case. Everybody, we want to pick up. Eat more high fiber and less fat, okay? So, and try to do exercise and try not to be obese. If you can lose weight, that's good, but at least if you try not to gain weight, that would be good. So if you can lose weight, better, but not, at least try not to gain weight, okay? I always tell my patient, exercise and eat less, okay? That's important. And avoid smoking, even one cigarette a day is not good, okay? Drinking, you know, the moderation, the small amount is okay, but avoid excessive drinking. And if you can, rem if you can actually eliminate alcohol is definitely good, especially cancer patient, you know, colon cancer patient. And in, in, in some study, even, you know, like uh, drinks, one drinks every day, maybe least some risk for the colon cancer recurrence. And remember, please, early detection, early de detection, that's what we want to pick up and to prevent, because I don't want to give chemo. If zero, I will have no, if we pick up every patient at the stage zero, I will have no job, that's okay. So, so, we, so please, please, okay? Question. So, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Azuri Williams. I am the event and program manager at Bermuda Cancer and Health Center. We would like to thank Dr. Ong and Dr. Eswick for presenting this evening. Thank you to Burn News for recording live for those who couldn't make it tonight. At this time, Burn News will turn off the camera and we will open the floor for Q&A.